Hi, so uh, let's get started on our very first mini lecture. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about sources of law. So in other words, when we talk about whether somebody is breaking the law or applying the law, um, what do we mean by law? So in the United States, we actually have a number of sources of law, uh, quite a few actually. And um, for practical purposes, they form a sort of hierarchy. So uh, for example, if there is a conflict between two different sources of law, we have a a system for determining which one wins, which types of law trump other types of law. So in the United States, the most um, uh, important or superior or highest ranking source of law is the Constitution. Uh, specifically, we have a US constitution, and then we also have state constitutions. Every state has its own constitution. Um, within a state, right, within the, for example, the jurisdiction of Texas, the Texas constitution is um, an extremely important source of law. The Texas constitution, though, does not apply in Louisiana. So if I were a, an attorney, for example, in Louisiana, I could not reference the Texas Constitution as justification for an argument that I was making on behalf of a client. So state constitutions are limited in their scope to the state in which they apply, or the state to which they apply. The U.S. Constitution, of course, applies across the country. Um, and in fact, there is language in the U.S. Constitution, something called the Supremacy Clause, that says that the Constitution and laws made pursuant to it are the supreme law of the land, which means that if, in fact, we had a conflict between the U.S. Constitution and a state constitution, the US Constitution would win. Indeed, if we have a conflict between um, a, a, the US, a US statute, right, uh, something passed by Congress pursuant to the power given to Congress by the US Constitution, that law trumps any state law, including the state constitution. So um, we have the federal constitution at the very tippity top, um, and then within each state, state constitutions are very, very important. The sort of next rung down in terms of sources of law are statutes. Statutes are uh, sort of any provision that is passed by a legislative body and then signed by the executive, or um, if the executive chooses to veto, then you know, that veto is overridden by a specific process. So if you follow the rules in the constitution for passing legislation, for passing a statute, then what you end up with is a statute, right? And that is a law. Um, a statute that conflicts with the US constitution is invalid, but otherwise statutes are kind of the highest level of law in our system. The next rung down are regulations. Regulations are provisions that are passed by executive branch officials. And those provisions tend to provide um, meat to statutes. So for example, um, Congress passes the Clean Air Act that says that the Environmental Protection Agency can make regulations that um, set standards for emissions in order to keep our air clean. And then the EPA creates a regulation that says that the maximum um, emission of arsenic is X number of parts per million, right? And then that, um, that regulation is now itself also law. If uh, the EPA were to create a regulation that conflicted 
with a statute, the statute would trump the regulation. The last rung in our sources of law in the United States is court-made law. Um, the US is something called a common law jurisdiction. That means that we uh, sort of took our legal system from the United Kingdom, from Great Britain, which is, which is kind of the original common law jurisdiction. Um, and the way common law works is that uh, law can develop through the resolution of, of disputes by courts. So for example, if a court um, ends up with a case where there's a fight between two people over a property line, uh, maybe it's like, can I cut down your tree that's on your property if your tree is overhanging my property and causing problems with my house, for example? Um, that sort of dispute is something that perhaps a court would resolve. And the court might say that I am allowed to only cut down the limbs that actually extend over my property and not encroach upon your property in order to further harm the tree. Um, that then becomes the law. And if someone else has a similar property dispute in the future, we can look back at the common law, at this body of decisions that have been created by courts, and we can say, oh, look, there's a rule. You can cut down the part of the tree that hangs over your property, but you can't go onto your neighbor's property to further harm the tree. Um, so that sort of development of law is extraordinarily important in common law jurisdictions, and particularly, um, certainly in the US. Um, we took existing common law um, when we broke from, from the United Kingdom in the late 1700s, we sort of adopted the common law that was in place in Great Britain at that time. But then our common law has now since developed independently. So the British common law, it's like, um, it's sort of like a, a, a evolution, right? You know, you, once a species splits off, it continues to evolve and its parent species also continues to evolve and they don't look anything like each other anymore. Um, actually, the US common law does look a lot like British common law, but there are some stark differences. And it's because of this historical gap, this time period during which US common law was developing independent of Great Britain. Uh, but again, the common law is the lowest rung of law in the United States, which means that any time the constitution, a statute or regulatory law conflicts with the common law, the common law is ignored. We ignore it. Okay, so let's look at an example of, of this, this idea of the hierarchy of laws. Um, specifically, we're going to look at contracts. A contract is an agreement between two people um, or two entities. It can be between two businesses, for example, but let's just stick with people. Um, so person A offers person B a thing and person B says, yes, I want that thing and I will agree to pay you X number of dollars and voila, now we have an agreement and um, that agreement can be enforced in a court. That's a contract. We'll talk more about contracts once we get to civil law, but for now that will do. Um, traditionally, contracts were governed by common law. So courts developed rules for how we should interpret agreements between people so that there's consistency and we can anticipate how the courts are going to interpret our contracts and we know what we can rely on. We, we know what the rules are and we're not surprised when we get to court and find out that we're wrong, right? Um, in the United States, there is something called the Uniform Commercial Code. Um, the Uniform Commercial Code governs commercial contracts. So contracts for the sale of goods and services. And uh, it is 
the Uniform Commercial Code was uh, sort of a, how to put this, kind of a model law that many states have enacted, either in um, in its entirety or some states have modified the UCC a little bit. But most states now have adopted the Uniform Commercial Code, at least in part. So now we have a statute or a series of statutes, statutes in every single state, um, honestly, that trump common law. So what? why does this matter? So at common law, there is a rule called the mailbox rule, <laughs> um, which is a great name. And it, it's, it's exactly that. It is about um, the importance of the mail system in creating contracts. So one of the issues that comes up in the interpretation and enforcement of contracts is at what point does a step in the contractual process become official? At what point can you no longer say, I want to take that back, right? Um, so at common law, the rule was, if A makes an offer to B and B um, chooses to accept that offer, the offer itself, is valid, is something that can be accepted at the time that B reads the offer, okay? So at the time it is communicated, at the time B learns of the offer. If B decides to accept the offer, says, yes, I like this agreement, I want to enter into this agreement with you, writes it down, says, signs the contract, and puts it in the mail, the minute that B puts that letter in a mailbox or hands it to a postal worker, his acceptance is complete. So he can't call up A while the mail is in transit and say, you're gonna get this contract, yeah, I signed it, but I really don't didn't want to, and um, I take it back, right? B can't do that. B has, it is, it is done. It is a done thing as soon as he drops it in the mail. So most parts of the contractual process are only valid, are only complete at the time that the other party learns of them. The other party receives the document or hears the offer. But when you accept an offer, the acceptance actually becomes legitimate at the time you put it in the mail, okay? So that's a difference. Acceptances are special under the mailbox rule. Okay, now let's look at another common law rule. If A makes an offer to B and B says, I do want to enter into an agreement with you, but I would like to change some of those terms. Yes, I will enter into this agreement, but I want $500 instead of $400, or I'm only willing to pay $300 instead of $400, right? Whatever the change is. Um, at common law, when B says, I like that offer, but I want to change it, B is not accepting the offer. Instead, B is saying no to the original offer and is instead making a counter offer. We'll see why this matters in just a second. Under the Uniform Commercial Code, it's more complicated. If A makes an offer and B says, yes, I want to enter into an agreement, but only if we change this provision, that may actually be considered an, the acceptance of an offer, right? It may be considered a counter offer. It may be considered an acceptance. It depends on a number of, con of contextual issues. So why does this matter? Again, remember under the common law mailbox rule, if A makes an offer to B, the offer is considered 
made at the time B reads the offer. But if B decides to accept the offer, the acceptance occurs at the time that the acceptance is put in the mailbox. So imagine that John calls Mary and he says, I would like to hire you to build a deck on my house. I will pay you $1,000. Think about it. Get back to me. Mary writes a letter to John and she says, I would love to build a deck for you, but I want you to pay me $1,500. And she puts it in the mailbox. John gets the, the mailbox or the, the letter that Mary wrote is now in transit, right? It's out of her hands. She can't get it back. She's mailed it. You can't go and get your mail back. It's, it's out of her hands. But now she's having second thoughts. John hasn't gotten the letter yet. He doesn't know what she said. So Mary's like, oh, man, I made a mistake. So she calls John and she says, changed my mind. I, I actually want $1,600, not $1,500. And John gets angry. And he says, I want out of this entire minute, or, or, or I, Actually, let's change this a bit. Mary wants now out of the agreement. That they, they start to get in a fight about the $1,600 versus $1,500. Mary decides John is just a huge jerk. And Mary says, never mind. I don't want this contract anymore. Can, he do, can she do that? It kind of depends because under the common law, there is no contract yet right? They don't have a meeting of the minds. And when um, Mary changed the terms of the contract, she changed the price. She wasn't accepting John's offer. She was making a counter offer. And that counter offer, remember, does not go into effect until John receives it. Right? That's the mailbox rule. Under the UCC, it depends because under the Uniform Commercial Code, when Mary writes, I would love to build a deck for you, but I want you to pay me $1,500, that may be considered an acceptance, not a counteroffer. And if it's an acceptance, then it became effective the minute she dropped it in the mail. So even though John hasn't gotten it, they have a contract. Right, she can't say backsies at this point. And so he can potentially sue her for breach of contract if she fails to show up and do the work. Now, of course, whether he would get any money for that is a whole nother matter. But the point is, do they have a contract? Well, it depends. Um, and if a state has adopted the Uniform Commercial Code, then that is what the courts will apply not the common law rule, because the UCC trumps the common law, okay? Um, I just wanna take a moment to mention judicial review. Um, judicial review is the process which we are going to talk about at great length at the end of the semester, where a court will review a statute or a regulation or um, an action by the US president or whatever, and not a state, a court will review those things and will say that is unconstitutional, right? And potentially invalidate a statute. Um, that seems confusing because it looks like we are placing judge-made law above a statute or above a regulation, but we're not. Because with judicial review, judicial review is not, <laughs> is not technically judge-made law. With judicial review, the courts are actually applying the constitution. It's their interpretation of the constitution, but it's the constitution. And the constitution, remember, is at the top of our hierarchy. So the constitution can um, invalidate a statute or invalidate um, a regulation. 
Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that becomes a little, that may seem confusing because it looks like we're allowing judges to be more important than legislatures. Um, we are, but only to the extent that they're interpreting the constitution. If it's just purely judge-made law, if the judges are making up rules, right, if it's common law, that does not um, invalidate. You can't use the common law to invalidate a statute or a regulation. Okay, so we're going to leave it there and um, I will pick up um, talking about analogical reasoning and, and legal reasoning in the next mini lecture.